audio. Uh, select a speaker. <laughs> select a microphone. Okay, that should be this one. And then the video is on. And then I share the screen. And then I talk to myself. Cool. There it is. All right. <clears throat> We are okay. We're officially recording, so don't say anything bad or secret. Okay, you guys want to get started? Who's excited? This is this is a, this is an energetic group. Okay, okay. Tonight's presentation is about Closure Script and React JS and a, and a framework called Reframe. It's those three topics. And it's going to be kind of like a Frankenstein presentation, and then it's not going to be that slide deck. So really, this, these talk notes are the presentation, and that slide deck is like an old presentation I did, but a lot of it still applies. So I'm going to like flip back and forth between the two. And then like halfway through the presentation, it's just going to be like code on the screen, right? So um, for the recording, I'm sharing the screen, but I'll leave this little video up in the corner, right? But if you can't see the code, like if you can't see in the back the code either, I can increase it or move up or something like that. Yeah. And I'm used to, like, I think I mentioned this a minute ago, but I teach at a coding boot camp, so I'm comfortable, like, speaking. But it's in, like, a lecture setting. This is, like, not a lecture setting. This is, like, a functional programmers group. This is a, a much, this is a very technical group, right? So, like, please, if you have questions, ask them. You know, I'll answer them. Let's, let's get into the details tonight. This is not, like, a high-level talk, basically. Make sense? What questions do we have? None. Okay. All right. So the purpose of this talk is I'm, I'm trying to convince you that closure script with reframe is an excellent choice for single page applications. Right. Um, and then I'm going to teach you a little bit of the basic concepts behind reframe. Uh, this is not a closure script talk though. Like I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to explain what closure script is, but this is not like a get your feet wet with closure script talk. I'm going to just kind of throw you in the pool of closure script and then we're going to go on from there. If that kind of makes sense. Right. Uh, okay, so about me. So I'm Chris Oakman. Um, let's see. I am pretty easy to find on the internet if you go to chrisoakman.com. That's me. I'm on like Twitter and I have a phone. You can reach me. You can email me. Um, <laughs> I've been a software developer for like more than a decade. It's primarily UI development, primarily web, primarily web development. I've built dozens of, applica of web applications. Um, <clears throat> I've used many programming languages. I'm the author of a handful of open source applications, uh, like libraries. Like I said, I teach at a coding boot camp. I started using Closure Script in 2013, so I've got some experience with it. And just to be clear, I'm not like I'm not trying to like brag. I'm just giving you context for like who I am and what my background is, so you kind of know where I'm coming from. Um, I got into Closure Script from JavaScript, so a lot of Closure developers are Java developers, and they find Closure. And I've like written almost like of the of the many programming languages I've used, almost none of them are Java. So I'm like purely like heavy JavaScript, and then I got into Closure Script, and then I kind of de facto know Closure because I know Closure Script. But it's kind of unique in terms of the Closure community, if that makes sense. Okay, so here's where we're gonna do the Frankenstein presentation. I'm gonna put this over here, maybe. And yes, if you're wondering, this is Windows. This is Windows. Please don't window shame me. Um, it's an operating system by a <laughs> Seattle-based software company. Um, I don't know if I can do this. I'm just going to kind of... Okay, so I gave a talk about Closure Script and React uh, like a year or so ago. And I'm just going to pull up the slides from this because the slides you can see, that's like the same idea, right? <clears throat> um, the slide, like all these slides are basically relevant to Closure if that makes sense. Or, sorry, the slides from this talk are relevant to, to this talk. So very quickly, it's like, what is it? It's, it's the language closure that compiles down to JavaScript. It looks like this. So if, you, if you've, like, raise your hand if you've never seen a Lisp before or like have no idea what a Lisp is. What's a Lisp? You should assume that that's true. So I'm gonna raise my hand. Yeah, no, that's great. Like, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, so this is what a Lisp looks like, right? <clears throat> kind of this, this, this syntax. Um, and but, if how, it, but how does that syntax work? Can you show them? Explain the syntax of the desk. Sure. So 
like we, we start a statement here and we close it here. So inside of that is an expression, okay? And then in closure specifically, and for most lists, this is also true. This is like a function call and these are the arguments, right? So really this is just like saying like var pi equals 3.1. Does that make sense? So, so you're, def means like define. Is that like, is that what you're going for? No. I mean, that's fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, but it's but it's flexible. Let me let me move forward, and we'll probably get to that. Okay, so it's a functional language. Uh, it's dynamically typed. It's Lisp syntax, right? All right, Lisp syntax. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, why? I've got two sets of slides. This is such a bad idea. Um, so when, so like your boss is like, all right, we got to write a web application for our users, and our users use web browsers. And you're like an awesome functional programmer and you're like, all right, great. I want to use Haskell for this choice or what's another like F sharp or something. Right. And the boss is like, no, it has to run on JavaScript. Right. Has anyone had this problem before? Okay. So when like you can write your application in JavaScript or you can write your application, you have, there's JavaScript, the language and JavaScript, the platform. Right. And you have to service JavaScript, the platform but you don't have to be tied to JavaScript the language, right? Now, a lot of people that do web development in 2019 are choosing JavaScript as the language in addition to choosing it as the platform, right? But you don't have to do that. You can, you can have your pick of languages. So you like statically typed languages? There's Scala.js and there's, um, I think there's an F-sharp to JS compiler, right? If you like, if you like Lisps and Clojure, you can do ClojureScript. Um, if you don't like semicolons, there's CoffeeScript, right? Hello, Michael. Chris. Yeah, <laughs> you've missed you've missed nothing. Well, I've been to this before, so I came for the rerun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a slightly different talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, so you've got all these options for compiled to JavaScript, right? Like, who uses a language that compiles to JavaScript? Anybody? And I'm I'm counting like, what if you use like ES6 or ES7? Raise your hand if you use Babel, and it compiles to JavaScript. Yeah. Right. So this is really popular. This is like JavaScript that compiles to JavaScript. But it's modern JavaScript compiling to older JavaScript, right? Um, but a lot of people, I feel like, don't make this, they don't make this decision between JavaScript, the platform, versus the language, right? They just kind of go with the language of the platform, when really, like, hey, you have a choice. You have a choice. So given, given your choices, Clojure is an excellent choice, is kind of the argument that I'm making. Um, so it's functional language. Focus on, it's, it's, uh, this is not a closure script talk. <laughs> the problem is I can talk about closure script for like hours. It's, it's a stable language that's practical, right? So it's not something like if you need to alert or print something to log or modify the DOM or do something which is an impure function, it's not, you don't have to like write a monad to do that, right? The compiler doesn't yell at you because you're trying to do some impure thing. You just do it, right? It's like right there available to you. Uh, so another thing is that closure script has really good interop with JavaScript. You're not missing anything. There's nothing you can't do from an interop standpoint. So if you've got some JavaScript library that you're heavily dependent upon, or you really want to use it in your, in your app, you absolutely can use it with closure script. And if you need to expose your closure script to some JavaScript, you can do that too. So it's not like, you know, if, if you go and you try to use Elm, it, like you're a little bit limited in how you have to interact with the, I don't know if it, has anyone ever used Elm? A little bit. You're a little bit constrained in how you have to interact with the outside world, right? Like, right? I mean, like, like certain libraries make assumptions that are not strictly compatible with what Elm is expecting. And it, you just don't, you don't run into that with Clojure, right? Clojure will let you, it's by default pure functions, but you can get, a, you know, you can write in pure functions if you want. It's not going to yell at you. Does that make sense? So it differs in that, that, that it prefers yeah. it prefers the idea of immutability, but it lets you. Let's yeah, let's just skirt it. Your, it's yeah, you it's can okay. do it. It doesn't. It's not going to yell at you exactly. Your program's not going to blow up. It's not going to refuse to compile. You know what I mean? It's not like Rust, right? <clears throat> okay. Another major selling point in language. I'm going to keep hammering this until somebody tells me it's not a selling point. Is that the build? Who's ever like configured Webpack? or like had to use Grunt, or Gulp, or Browserify, or like the, what was the YUI toolkit talk called? Like that Bauer. old thing? Hmm? Bauer? Bauer is another one. Can we keep going? What are some other ones? Let's keep going, right? <laughs> how, how, how many NPM <laughs> scripts, right, bash scripts? I mean, how many, how many JavaScript front-end build systems do we need, right? 
And which of the which of these will be around five years from now? All of them. Hmm? Yeah, <laughs> in legacy mode, right? In like, uh, oh, we. I think that, but no. Yeah, Let's like, oh, we desperately wish we could find a programmer that understood, you know, our broccoli script or whatever, whatever that was a couple years ago, right? So this is a major source of incidental complexity for modern web development is setting up, setting up the build, right? And in fact, it's so complex for the React project. It was such a complaint on the React project that the React developers created a separate project, which is called Create React App. And their, their official advice to you is to use their separate project, which is called Create React App, which if you, if you basically they're saying, you have to use this project in order to use this other project. And Create React App downloads, I think it's like 21 million lines of code or something like that in the Node module script. And that's all like development code, it's build code, right? You're not shipping 21 million lines to the, to the, uh, to the client, but it's still absurd, right? It is absurd how big Create React App and how complex Create React App is. When I teach React at, at Coding Bootcamp, like number one problem we have is people understanding Create React App. Like why does this exist? How is, you know, what is it doing? Right, this is absolutely black magic. So a major selling point of closure is that the build system is part of the language, right? It's part of the language and it's not, so it's, it's not gonna change. Or if it does change, it'll change with the language. So you can be working for company A and they're using build tool X and you're working for company B and they're using build tool Z, but it's really the same build tool underneath the hood. Does that kind of make sense? And again, I'm talking about closure script, right? So they, they, when they built the language, they decided that they decided that that should be part of the language, and that's a huge benefit. Okay, uh, let's see. I just can't, I can't talk about all this. Um, the syntax. So the syntax is that really simple syntax, <laughs> and the the trick to that is that it's stable and it's flexible and it's future proof. So the JavaScript community has added. Has anyone used async await? In this right? Do you like it? Do you like async await? Is it is it good? Yeah, yeah. Maybe so. Maybe so. No, no. Okay. It's not like I'm not fish for answers. You can say whatever. What is async await? Who think who has no idea what async await is in JavaScript? No. It's kind of like a. It, it's a, it's like a syntax hack on top of the language to give to to give you asynchronous operations. Right. So it gives you asynchronous operations, but it, they look synchronous. In, it defines a closure, right? It uses promises, I think, under the hood. Yeah. But like the closure community added their version of what is core async, or excuse me, of what is async and await with a library called core async. And this is not like a theoretical thing that they, they theoretically could do. They actually did this. They, they, were, they were like, oh, we want, we want to be able to write things that are asynchronous but look synchronous. So let's make a library and ship it, and it ships to both Clojure and Clojure Script, the exact same library, and it works today. So whatever changes are happening down the pipe with, with respect to programming languages and syntax, the flexible syntax of Lisp is available to change as time changes, if that sort of makes sense. Yeah. What about the terrifying parentheses? Hmm? <laughs> so that's a great question, which is what about the terrifying parentheses? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean that's kind of that's kind of a comment that everybody everybody mentions um, if they haven't used Lisp is basically it looks very different and very strange from other programming languages, and that's like a legitimate that's like a legitimate concern is yeah. essentially how do we like this looks so alien I can't that doesn't look like anything that I'm familiar with how can I connect that right uh, fine like I mean, there's many answers to that question. One answer is find any, what the, the simplest answer is that you'll get over it and you'll love it essentially. Um, that's kind of right. But, and if you don't, if you don't want to just take my word for that, you could ask anybody who's used Lisp, Lisp syntax for more than let's say a thousand lines of codes, arbitrary ish number, ask them if it's a problem, right? Ask them if like, if the actual, if that, if that Lisp syntax is a benefit or if it's a, or if it's a, if it's a bad thing, right? And you, I think you'll find universally that people say, no, it's beneficial, right? Um, another thing real quick, or well, we'll get into this when we get in the code. If you're thinking that you have to manage uh, like this down here, like if you're thinking, do you expect me to write closing curly brace, closing bracket, closing bracket, closing parentheses? No, never, right? You, you don't have to write that. The editor can figure that out for you. 
And uh, like when we do the actual code, I'll, I'll for sure show you uh, how that works. It's incredibly simple. What? It's really hard for me from back here. Okay. You can do that. Uh, all right, let me move on. Da, 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 da. Okay, so it's simple and practical. It's stable. It's got this. It's got a very powerful, extensive core library. That's another thing. Like JavaScript has a tiny core library. So depending on which project you're working on, maybe they're using jQuery, maybe they're using YUI, maybe it's using React, maybe it's using underscore, maybe it's using Vue, maybe it's using Angular. Right? I can keep going. These are all very different projects, right? Who has, who has used a project with like two separate technologies like I kind of just said, right? H how transferable is that knowledge between the projects? No. N not, right, is it the same language? Yeah, it is, right, it's JavaScript, right? But how come you can't transfer that knowledge between those projects? It's because once you, once you get tied to like a library or a framework, you're heavily invested in it, right? So because JavaScript has a small core library, uh, you know, different JavaScript projects are just very different from one another. Clojure has this massive core library that everybody is using. It's always the same on every project. So you go from project one to project two to project three, and they're all pretty much using the same functions, right? So that's like another really nice benefit. Okay. Uh, if you're more interested in the benefits of Clojure, I literally could spend hours selling you on Clojure, and I'm going to stop at this point. If any of this is sound intriguing, or you have like, an, like a, a wiggle and you're like, yeah, should I check that out later? Maybe that guy knows what he's talking about. I highly recommend this talk. It's called Simple Made Easy by the creator of the language. And probably more than any other talk, this talk will sell you on these ideas in Clojure. Uh, who has seen this talk? Out of curiosity. Okay, yeah, good talk, worth your time. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, there, boom, right there, you universal. You don't mind Clojure, it's great. Yeah, exactly. I actually watched this talk like probably 10 times before I ever learned any Clojure at all. It's just a great talk for programming. Okay, that's closure. Why closure script? I already kind of mentioned this because I'm blurring the lines here. It's got that language level state management, build system is part of the language, which means it's not gonna change. It's built on this thing called the Google Closure toolchain, which is the, the actual tool that Google uses for Google.com, Google Drive, Gmail, their major web properties. It's not Angular. They don't use Angular for anything serious. Um, they use this tool, and it's an open source tool, and it's a very powerful tool, um, and Closure Script is built on top of this tool. This tool, the, the, the Closure toolchain, like, it is open source, but the broader JavaScript community has not, it's not had wide adoption, right? The, the, job, the broader JavaScript community has sort of chosen different paths in terms of tooling, but this tool is still actively maintained by thousands of like well-paid Google engineers. Google has a significant investment in this and it's, it's not going away anytime soon. And it's best of breed, right? This is maybe changing in the last two to three years um, and the other tooling is kind of catching up to where this was, but this is still definitely best of breed tooling. So it's, it's a massive core library. It's also like a compiler and like a namespace system and an organization system. And it all works exceptionally well for Google, which is, Obviously, heavily battle-tested, you know, situation. What's up? You have, you have question face. Oh, uh, <laughs> just trying to language level state management. Yeah, uh, where's that? Here. Ah. Okay, so mm -hmm. defaults matter, right? And in JavaScript, when you create a variable, can you change it on the next line? Yes. Yes, and that's the default, right? And you kind of have to go out of your way to not change it. Right? And then, I, I know that const is in the language now, so that's not necessarily true. But even const is weird. We can say const x equals an object, and then we can mutate properties of that object on the next line. Well, why, why do I have const at all? Was, right? You're just lying to me. It's not a const that, right? Okay. So, so defaults matter. You have to go out of your way to have immutability in JavaScript. In Clojure, everything is immutable by default. But if you need mutability, it's right there in the core library. So the way, to, the way to get mutability in Clojure is a thing called an atom. So you make the atom, and then you can change the atom, and then that's how it works. But it's, part, but it's not like if you're on a Clojure project, you, you have a library that creates atoms for you, and this other Clojure project has a separate library that does state management. We're all just using atoms because it's part of the core library. Does that make sense? So Clojure has great defaults for basically everything. Right, it's got namespaces, so it's got code organization part of the language. Again, I mentioned this build system a zillion times. 
Um, it's got state management as part of the language. It's got this awesome core library that basically has everything you need to do, right? Um, it's great. It's got flexible syntax, right? Um, and it's stable. It's stable. You can pull up a ClojureScript project from five or six years ago and run the, the install instructions, and it just runs. You're not going to get NPM warnings, and it's just, it's just, it's stable, right? It's good. I'm a big fan of it. They call me Mr. Closure Script at the Closure conferences. <laughs> I also call you that. Do you call me that too? Yeah, yeah. that's fair. Okay, so if you've watched, if you've watched the other talk by by uh, Rich Yuki about the language, but you're interested in Closure Script specifically, this talk by Derek Slager is my recommendation. And this is like this is a really funny talk, and it's a good talk. It's from a couple of years ago, but it's still very relevant. Everything he said is is true. It's true because it hasn't changed because the language is stable. <laughs> Is that, you seeing a trend here? Okay. So I'm wondering, Chris, if the yeah. language is that stable and nothing's breaking, what kind of growth have you seen? Uh, that's a good question, which is basically like the community. So the closure community is a smaller community, relatively speaking, meaning it's, I, I would say that objectively speaking, it's not a small community. You can't look at it and say that's a small community. You can only say that's a small community relative to the JavaScript community or relative to the Java community. So to put this in perspective, Closure Conj happens every year. Like, there's multiple, I keep mentioning the Conj. There's multiple closure conferences that happen every year around the world. There's like four or five of them that happen pretty much every single year. The main one is Closure Conj. It gets attendance of like four to 500 people every year. And of those four to 500, I think on average, 300 to like 350 of them are, it's their first conference, right? So the, re, I mean, you, you, like, you do have the repeat people but you also have this big influx of new people. Um, every year, the co there's a company called Cognitect, which is kind of like um, Rich Hickey works for Cognitect, and some of the core developers on Clojure work for Cognitect. And they, like, they, run, they run Clojure Cons, and they also run like uh, surveys, like community surveys, and they publish their results. So you can see, like, you can see the size of the community for yourself. Um, it's not the largest community on, like, of, program of programmers but it's large enough that there's like plenty of companies, plenty of jobs, plenty of people, you know, like, <clears throat> and then it's, it's a, it's a good community. It's a community of smart, friendly people, right? Like, like uh, communities have a culture and the culture in closure, I think is smart and friendly. So, yeah. Let's keep this question. Mm -hmm. You're talking about uh, its stability versus its growth. And one of the facets of it is that it's because it's a list, it doesn't expand into the syntax of core library. That was pretty much how React got took up by the world, as I recall correctly. React doesn't have a handout in the but when they first did, you know, um, what's library? The one of any two things. Reagent. Reagent. Yeah. It was like one of the first updates of React. Yeah. I would I, like the, the strict. The short answer to your question is, I would say it's bleeding edge. I would say there's not a there's like nothing in the in the there's no library or programming language feature that, that that's major that's like you would say that's really modern we need that the closure doesn't have now that now some people would nitpick and be like well it doesn't have the Rust type checker well okay it's not trying to have that or, or the borrow checker it's not trying to have that that's a different thing but there's nothing like 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 name some kind of some kind of library or some kind something that you want that you'd expect in a language. I'd be willing to bet a nickel that it's in Clojure and Clojure Script, if that makes sense, right? So I don't know, database findings. Like, yes, yes, it's got stuff like that. It's got, yeah. Can I play bad guy? Yeah, play bad guy. Is, is, growth, uh, is, is growth of the language and growth of the community not a concern for, for the community? Um, it, I mean, it, like, what's the purpose of growth, right? Like, like what, why are you growing? You know, does it matter how you grow? So, like, it's, like, objectively speaking, it's a smaller community than something else. Like, that's not, that's not up for debate. That's, like, an obvious fact. But, like, does, it, does that matter? Uh, like, you don't want to use a tiny language where you can't get support and there's no libraries and you can't, you know, there's no one to talk to and there's no community, right? None of those things are true of closure. Look at this room right now. <laughs> this is the most people I've seen in a functional meetup in months, right? So, uh, I mean, you can get on the Slack and get help, like, 
in an like I don't know, it's not a ghost town. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Like doesn't mean it's bigger than the JavaScript community. Like it's not, but it's like at what size do you need to be? Like, right? Like, do you really benefit because there's 20,000 people instead of 10,000 people? No, but I, you know? I think the question was, it, yeah. just in the community, is mm. there concern about, we need to be oh. growing, we need to be recruiting more people, we need to... Yeah, some people are probably talking about that. I think in the last year, there's the been language. some... There's been a lot of, I mean, there's I been a lot of concern in the is last year. Is there a more year. evangelical yeah. language than this? Is there what? I got it. Is there is what? Is there more evangelical language than this? But it has been yeah. like yeah, some people lying to say if it weren't, it wasn't a community it concern. It's a thing. Well, like there's different. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to be too defensive about it. But people have talked about this in the last year. They're like the death of closure is a thing that people have talked about. But the numbers don't match that at all. It's like it's a story that doesn't make any sense. None of the none of the closure survey numbers match that story. So it's just like some blog post that some pissed off person wrote, and then there's a bunch of Twitter threads. But like day to day, there's people get like, there's lots of people, thousands of people working in closure every day, getting things done, going to conferences, writing libraries, writing best of breed stuff, you know, writing, writing some of the best tooling for out there for JavaScript, in my opinion, you're going to see it here. If I ever stop talking about this. <laughs> right. Does the JavaScript so, stuff have like a line again equivalent? Is there? Yeah. So it's line again. Yeah. And then there's yeah, all it just runs line again straight out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you can use line again for, for closure script and you can also use a thing called shadow seal JS, which I'm going to use tonight. Okay. Here's, show here's all your magic tools. Oh yeah. I will. I'll show you the magic tools. You're going to see the magic tools. All right, yeah. awesome. Um, I'll, I'll note real quick. So line again is like a build tool and that's what Mark is talking about. I'll also note that you can very easily switch between line again and shadow for a closure script project because the important build tool happens at the language level, not in those kind of like auxiliary tools. This is all kind of nitty gritty, I but it, these are good questions. Dope, yeah, this is a great tool. There's nothing, there's nothing. Super, super good. Yeah, there's nothing wrong. Yeah, see, the tooling is super good. It, yeah, I, and yeah, I'm not even like a evangelist like Chris. I, I just think it's a really neat uh, interface to deal with. Yeah, it's good stuff. To deal with your project. Okay, let me make sure I just covered all these topic points. Actually, since since Chris is looking for something, I'll just say the one thing I don't like about Clojure that I uh, historically have not liked is how long it takes to start the JavaScript VM. Uh, that's the only thing that I found really seriously the, irritating. Which which Clojure. one? Which one? That you said the Java. You mean the Java, Java, Java or VM. You mean Java? Okay, I think you said right. JavaScript. But so you meant JVM. So when you go yeah. and you type run and then you type your jar or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It can take a long time, a noticeable to get, amount to get of time before. It yeah, yeah, yeah. Does stuff, you know. Yeah, totally, so, totally. Yeah. I know there are like hacks around that and whatever, but like that's just my big yeah. sort of irritation. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, there's there's like technical reasons for why that is. I, but I understand. It that. is. Yeah, it, I, it, it's just part it's of a, the package. But yeah, that's like yeah it's a pain point. Right. It is. Yeah, it is. It's like a pain point essentially. Once you get it up and running, it's very fast. Yeah, again, yeah. you'll see this. Now, once you do like line again, and you just feel like at the prompt, and you just type stuff in, and it's like split. Like, yeah. Okay, enough about closure script. Watch those videos or talk to me or talk to Patrick <laughs> um, if you're super interested in closure. So now that you're all super interested in closure, <laughs> closure script, <laughs> we're gonna talk about React. <laughs> Hands again, who has React experience? Who has like never used it, doesn't even know what it is? Damn. Okay. Uh, Dude, I write servers all day long. I, I know, I know. I touch front end stuff. I know. Um, Okay, React, then I'm gonna just not spend a ton of time. I'll just hit the highlights for you guys. So it's a way of declaratively describing your DOM. So the, traditionally you have this web page and then you run some JavaScript and you modify that web page, right? Via DOM manipulation. So you can change a button, you can hide a div, you can add a div, right? And so React says, no, I'm gonna make a component and that component describes what I want. And then I'm gonna, that component's gonna go through state changes that I'm controlling programmatically. And then React library, you figure out how to get from state A to state B. So this little diagram kind of shows it. So I've got a tree of components. These are React components and they map to HTML DOM. And then I say, oh, look, we're gonna change this stuff in this tree. So this is the same, this is the same, that's changed, this is the same, that's changed, right? And then the React library will perform the exact number of DOM operations needed to get from this state to this state. Does that kind of make sense? 
So if you've ever written jQuery, where it's like show this div, hide this div, all that, you don't write any DOM manipulation code in React. You only write these components that describe what the DOM should look like, and then the React library figures out how to do that. Does that make sense? Especially for the people who have not used React. Or do we need more explanation? OK. Um, another, I love this slide. <laughs> uh, another, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, these two tools are like made for each other. They are like perfect. And what is your name, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah. Clay. Clay? Um, what Clay said a minute ago is that the re the closure when React was first released, um, the closure script community had very rapid uptake of it because they they recognize like the pairing strengths between. Closure script strengths and React, like what React is doing under the hood. So I'm going to talk about those real quick because they're definitely relevant. Uh, so, number one, the React community, you have, you, like because you're writing components which are HTML, you're writing, or, the, or sorry, you're writing components that become HTML. The React community invented this thing called JSX, which is basically this totally custom syntax that has no basis in like language theory. That is literally, it's like, like by their own description, it's literally a hack on top of JavaScript to get React, to make React look like more, look more like HTML than it really is, right? So when you're writing React and you're writing JSX, it looks like you're writing HTML, but in reality, under the hood, those are like JavaScript function calls and you're creating synthetic virtual DOM nodes. Does that kind of make sense? So again, when I teach React to students who are all kind of like new, this confuses them because they're like, oh, I'm writing HTML. Not really, not really, you know, little Billy student, you're writing virtual DOM <laughs> nodes that get, that get transpiled through Babel, through a Babel plugin called JSX. And he's just like, what did you just say to me, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he's trying to wrangle with Git and his you know, partner is talking to him and stuff. Here. Okay, so <laughs> JSX is just insanity, okay? I mean, I, this is one of my pet peeves. When I, when I first saw it, I just said, oh, that's crap. That's, like, that's not going to be around. Four or five years from now, that's that's they're never going to add that to the language proper. You're trying to describe data using a tree, right? That's what HTML is, right? It's data in a tree. Why don't you use a tree to represent the data? Wouldn't that make sense? That makes sense yeah. to me. Yeah. So. And if you like Lisp, you like trees. Yes, yes. because Lisp language is a damn tree. So <laughs> let's go back to this slide and. Even if you don't really follow this, even if this kind of looks like garbledy gook down here, you can at least squint your eyes and be like, you know what? I bet that becomes HTML at some point, right? Right? Does anyone think that that's like a SQL call? <laughs> no, right? And if again, if that looks really alien to you, it doesn't take very long before that looks really normal, and anything that's not that starts to look really alien, or rather, really like busy. Right? Uh, closure devs in the room, back me up on that. True or false? True. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> closure devs are like vocal. Okay. All right. So, again, this is normal. This is not JSX. There's like really nothing, from a list perspective, there's nothing super special about this. This is just kind of like par for the course, like all our code might look like that, right? So, that translates. Um, bah, 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 where are we? Keep hitting. You're past the happy face. Come on. There it is. Okay, so you don't need these crazy compiler hacks, right? You've got syntax that can just trick to compile to what you want. I'm not going to demo this tonight, but I did this the last time I gave this talk, and the audience like loved it. But I showed some DOM that like kind of like I had on that slide one, and I had it, and I said, well, I'll just I'll show you guys in code. I won't actually do the compilation. Um, but that syntax is really powerful. Everything is immutable by default. And then you've got these components. So your React components, they compose like functions. And so in a language that's a functional language where everything by default is a pure function, it composes really cleanly together. So who knows what a persistent data structure is? All right. So who doesn't know? Like shaming, All right? <laughs> OK. So persistent data structure is a different way to store data. So generally, let's say, imagine that you've got a big piece of JSON, big piece of data, all right? And then, let's say you've got like 100 students, an array, it's got 100 items, and each item is an object, and the object has 
five or six keys, and it's let's say it's all strings, but some of them are numbers, right? So big piece of data, okay? And I go into the eighth item in the array, and I go to one of those keys, and I change one thing, right? And I say, okay, this is data structure A, and that's data structure B. Would we say those two are the same? No. No, right? Because, like I said, it's different, right? Yeah. You okay. Did. Yeah, but how do you determine whether those are the same? Well, we're going to start at the top. Okay, this is the first item. Is that the same? Let's check the keys. Is that the same? Is that the same? Yada, 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 right? It may take some time for your program to check to see if those two data structures are, are different. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And, if, and if, what, if, what if instead of 100 items, we've got 10 million? Now we're really talking about some, some potential expensive complexity. Does that follow? Does this analogy kind of follow? So what a persistent data structure does is it says, okay, we're going to sort everything in a tree like this. So if, if, if I'm X right here, I'm going to point to D, and D's going to have B, it's going to have C and A, and G, and F, and H. And that's, and that's going to represent like the JSON, right? And then I'm going to make my little change, and that's going to be here. And so I'm going to, and I'm going to call this Y. And so Y is going to be here, but Y points to B. So they share the same structure. And Y has a new G, it doesn't share this G. It's got F, but it shares H. Does everyone kind of see this? So these are two different data structures that have, this is called structural sharing. Structural sharing. So we could add a third one that points to G here, but then it adds another node. You guys get the idea, right? And this, and this is like a very small example for visualization, but what if your B node had a million nodes below it? And you had, your, your job was to tell me whether X and Y are the same, right? You'd be sad. Well, do you have to check node no. B? No. no, right? Because it's, right? If it's not it, mutated. It's not mutated, right? So remember, it's got a million nodes underneath it, and your task is to tell me if these are the same. Or, uh, and you get to B, you, you, oh, they point both, both would be, I don't need to check below, right? Does that make sense? So your intuition about what is a fast operation and what's a slow operation may be different with a persistent data structure. So creation of a, of a data structure, of a, of a, a persistent data structure is PDS. I'll say it's easier to say. When you create a PDS, it takes some time. It takes more time than to create like uh, a uh, transient data structure, like a normal data structure. So it takes more time to create a closure hash map than to create a JavaScript object, for example. Okay. But it takes less time, given two maps, tell me if they're equal, that takes like almost no time in a PDS. But it takes a lot of time in JavaScript. And the, the larger those data structures grow, the more that time takes, right? Who's ever, like, and again, I'm kind of speaking to the JavaScript developers, so I apologize if you're like not following this vocabulary. But who knows about like deep strict equal in JavaScript for writing tests or whatever for comparison? Yeah? So deep strict equal in closure happens instantaneously because it literally just says, are they the same node? Yes, no, boom. It literally takes like a nanosecond to do deep strict equal, even on like vectors of hash maps of millions of items. It's, it's just because everything in closure is this by default. You have to go out of your way to not be using this kind of data structure. What does this look like? Like a tree? Oh, what are React components made out of? Trees? How does React need to figure out how to transfer? How does React need to figure out what needs to update? It checks for equality in the tree. Right? <laughs> okay, so some of the, uh, that's it, okay. You get incredibly fast updates with closure script, right? So basically what you're saying, you got this tree of DOM nodes and, you, and it's all mapped to a persistent data structure. And you can just say, are these two nodes the same? And closure script can answer that question instantaneously. And then you can just tell React, well, you don't need to render anything. You're good. So a lot of closure script libraries, like I'm not exaggerating, they just render every request animation frame. <laughs> right? It doesn't matter, right? Um, can you imagine doing that in Redux? Does anybody like use Redux? Yeah, no, maybe, okay. Different audience, yeah. So, Clojure gets compiled to JavaScript, right? Yes. So at the end, we're still running JavaScript. Mm -hmm. yes. So all those millions of objects are gonna be slow layer in JavaScript or not? 
So like this implementation of the persistent data structures is written in like it's written in the in the closure script which compiles to JavaScript and the implementation in JavaScript it has this has these properties. So like it's it's fast enough that it can be used in any kind of modern web situation. Like it can be used you on like a library in JavaScript that yeah. output these data structures. Yes. And did transformations on these data structures. And then you can imagine that closure just uses that library which are automatically for their use. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean you know this because you did this for your final project. Mm -hmm. um, if you've ever heard of immutable who's ever heard of immutable JS, the library? So okay, yeah. Closure has closure is using like closure does not use immutable JS. Closure has its own implementation of immutable data structures, but it's very very similar to immutable JS. Wow. These two libraries are effectively the same thing. Yeah. Why do they need a library for immutable data structures? Can't that be built into a language that immutable data structures? Well, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd certainly be nice if language designers uh, made that the default choice, wouldn't it? Well, I mean, closure. closure yeah. That, right? What? Closure. Yeah, closure so when you're compiling the JavaScript to any mutable underpinning, then you just don't don't make any mutations, so you don't need to have any special libraries for that, right? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, <laughs> this is the benefit of using ClojureScript is that I mean you are constrained by the limitations of whatever platform you're on, right? So in the case of in the case of JavaScript, you know your lowest primitive you have is is the JavaScript object. Those are going to be I don't know, I'm not talking about Wasm, okay? I'm, that's not what I'm talking about, but you know, the lowest primitive you have is a mutable object. And so yes, deep under the hood, if you open up the wiring, this is implemented using mutable stateful JavaScript objects, but that's not exposed to you as a developer. You don't, like if you're writing in ClojureScript, you don't even have the opportunity to reach in there and, and tweak that. It's not even possible. Um, yeah. So you, you mentioned interoperability or clean operation in the language of JavaScript. Yeah. Uh, if you expose something from, from Clojure to JavaScript, uh, and then modify that thing. Mm -hmm. Does that just then? Go? So, if you that's a great question. All right. So, if, let's say you have a closure map, and you want to, for some reason, export that to JavaScript, have JavaScript bang on it, and then like return it. You will have to go through conversion of from immutable data structure to mutable, bang on it, and then convert it back to immutable. Right. If that's what you need to do, like you like desperately need to do that, uh, there's probably like a <laughs> there's probably a better way, or there's probably a different way to do that, where instead of ex like instead of just returning this data, instead of having to pay the cost of conversion, which there is some cost to that, okay, it's not all free, um, but instead of having to pay for that cost of conversion, you could you could provide some kind of like, I mean, what what is that function actually doing on the data, and you could just expose that function, if that makes sense. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm not saying that. That's what you want to do necessarily, but um, body body student will eventually uh, graduate graduate from your course, yeah, and be working in some situation where he may act, you know, inadvertently modify something that he shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me show you guys that thing real fast that people loved because I seem like you guys are interested in this. Is it the syntax demo? Yeah, here it is. I'm not going to run this. You just have to look at it. And yep. Is that how's that? Oh, that's really big. Okay. So, pretty simple. I've got Texas. I've got this is a, like a an array of arrays, or this is in the closure script vocabularies. This is a vector of vectors, right? Pretty simple. I've just got these cities, and then I've got some descriptions, some accurate descriptions of these cities, right? Okay. So everyone follow. This is just like some data, right? And then what I'm doing is I'm I'm calling this function create table and I'm passing in I'm just passing in this data to here right so let's look at the create table function and what is this what is this here yeah so what does this function do I mean again if you like you don't need to know, like if you squint your eyes I and mean, what do you think this function is doing it's building a table of what of, SQL. Yeah, SQL. Yeah, exactly. This guy's, this guy's paying attention. Yes. This is a MongoDB call. Okay. So yeah, so this is building a data structure which represents an HTML table. And it's using that data to do it, right? There's no library here. This is vanilla closure. This is like there's no, there's no, there's no React, right? There's nothing at all. 
Everyone kind of follow? It's very, very basic. All right. And then I'm not going to run this. You just trust me. It works. If you comment this out, if you take this exact same thing and you send it to this library, it returns a honest to God HTML string that you can throw in that you can do, you know, dom element .enter HTML equals this guy and it will, it'll be that table. And if you take this exact same thing and you send it to that function, it returns an honest to God uh, react component that will render that table, right? Yay! Okay. And four years from now, when the new hot library, the banana JS library, is taking the world by storm and React as an afterthought, like you know, uh, Backbone JS or whatever, in the closed script community will simply add a new library that you send to the banana JS. You know, the, the, the closed script community will be already ready to handle this situation. Does that make sense? So if you if you went to a React project that had like tens of thousands of lines of JSX, and you said, okay, you've got to make all that JSX available in static HTML, or React components, or Vue components. Like what? Like yeah, you, you're this guy's literally like shaking his head, like not gonna happen, right? He's thinking about it, and he's like, there's no way, there's no way, right? Your average closure programmer would be like, oh, whatever, it's not a big deal, right? Make sense? Everyone kind of cool. Okay. All right, we are deep in this presentation. We have not talked about reframe at all. <laughs> Do we have any questions about uh, React? No? All right, let me cover some quick things. Da, 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 da. So, uh, okay. This approach is taking web development by storm. It's extremely popular. And if you're not using React, you might be using something else like Vue or Elm or Cycle.js. Or there, there's, there's many of them now. But the pattern of this virtual DOM and creating a tree like this is extremely popular. So it's, it's safe to say that this is not going to go anywhere. Right? I mean, who uses it right now? Right? Like most of the people had already said they use React or they use something similar. So React components can, have, can act like pure functions and take props. Or components can have local state, and that's called state. Again, this is like React terminology. So the React community quickly realized, if I've got 30 components on the page, and each component has local state, that is crazy. Okay? It basically like relearned the same lesson that, that of object-oriented, the stateful object-oriented programming is a mess if you put it in a tree, and you have no idea what state everything is at any given one point in time. Okay? Uh, so the, the React community, like there's a library called Redux. Raise your hand if you're familiar with Redux. Okay. So Redux is basically an approach to state management where we say, listen, there's one source of state. There's one source of truth, and it's right here. Okay? It's not over here. It's not in that component. It's not. It's right here. And we're going to call this the store, right? Think of it like the mothership. And there's only one way in the store and one way out of the store. Okay? And so... The, 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 React, the React community kind of converged on this and saying, we've got a store here, we've got pure components that are downstream of the store, and the way to get in the store is to pass in data. So like, raise your hand if you use Redux and you like Redux and Redux is good. Okay, maybe like half the room kind of, okay. So other community, I'm kind of moving through this so we can get to reframe. Other communities have found this exact same pattern is working. So the Elm architecture is very much this way the kind of early closure script adoptions of uh, React before Redux even existed worked exactly in this way. Um, the JavaScript community is always like lagging behind the closure script community. Closure script people like figure it out and then a couple years later a JavaScript guy tweets it and people are like, oh, you figured it out. I'm like, no, you didn't. You just weren't paying attention to the right programming language community. Um, but this is a popular, like this is a popular approach to managing this and does it work well? Who used Redux and it works well? Yeah, I think there's general, like my students like it. I think there's general consensus that Redux done well does work well. So I think that speaks to this pattern working well. What's difficult in Redux, Redux users? Maybe defensive, uh, defensive updating copying? Updating a deep object. Updating a deep object, right? Def maybe all that defensive copying you have to do when you update the store. Isn't that a pain in the butt? My students totally struggle with that. Right? 
Yeah. You have to have everything scattered all over the place. Yeah, scattered over the place. Yeah, action. I hate action creators. Why do I need a function to make some data? Why can't I just use data? Right? I think action creators are stupid. But that's not what this talk is about. Okay. What is reagent? So this was already mentioned. So a very early closure script wrapper around the React library was this thing called reagent. And I'm going to show you some code so you can get a sense for it. But remember, when I, remember I mentioned atoms earlier? In closure, if you want to have something that changes over time, you have to make an atom. So what, what is in, in the Redux store? Does the Redux store change over time? Yeah, it's this state now, and then we make some change, and now it's some new state. Right? Then we make some other change, and now it's some new state. It's data that's changing over time. What's the value in your store? Depends on what time it is. Right? So if you want to do that in closure, you have to use an atom. And so uh, Reagent recognized, oh, like we have state management built into the language. Let's just make it so that any time you deref an atom, which means you're getting the value out of the atom, you just re-render the component. Right? And now we don't need any more library because we're already using Closure Core Library to update atoms. So let me just show you. Uh, let me show you how this works. Code time. Reagent. Time for a perilous live demo. Now it's going to be very soon. A time for a perilous live demo. Oh, that's the wrong link. There we go. Okay. Again, you don't need to like totally get this. All right. We've seen this before, right? What is this? Probably. You make that way bigger. Okay. It like. I know I need to, but it, like, on the recording, people can see it. But uh, it, what's that going to become? Definitely SQL. Yeah, definitely MongoDB SQL calls. <laughs> right, okay. All right, uh, but let me skip to this guy. Where's the one with the, uh, the, the you click the button? Here it is. All right, let's look at this one. So we're going to click, and it's going to increase this counter. So what's happening, let me walk you through this. Ah. We're going to make an atom but we're making a reagent atom, or a atom, if you want to call it. It's just like a normal closure atom, except when you get the value out of it inside of a React component, it triggers the React internal library to say re-render, which makes sense, because if you've changed it, well, we need to check that tree again, and we need to re-render. Okay. So make an atom starting in at zero. Here's a component. Again, syntax, which becomes a MongoDB call, HTML. I'm going to say HTML. That joke is played out. So, <laughs> this at symbol means to deref, which means take this thing and get me the value out of it, right? This is a function call. It doesn't look like one because of syntax sugar, but this is actually a function call right here. It's saying, uh, what's an example? What's the Redux equivalent of this? Um, it's getting the value out of a store. What's that, what's that function call? What? Yeah, 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 that's, that's the one. Okay, that's what this is doing right here. This is a button, and this is the on-click event. This uh, pound sign with a parenthesis means like anonymous function. Think arrow function if you're a JavaScript guy. It's arrow function right here. So we're going to swap click count ink. This is ink is a core library function which increments by one, right? So we click this value, we swap ink count, that changes the atom, and then reagent was like, oh, you. You, like, I've got an atom that derefed and you changed it, time to re-render. Does that follow? And so that loop that I just explained is exactly what's happening with this. What questions do we have? That's like a teaching thing. You don't say, who has questions? Because then you're singling somebody out. You say, what questions do we have? And then it's like a community thing. Yeah. So Closure doesn't have classes, right? That is correct. Like. Yeah, that is correct. That, that is correct. That is correct. Asterisk. I thought, I thought okay. Asterisk. Ask me later. But so yeah. React uses classes for life cycle hooks. How do you do that? The short. Okay. There's two answers to your question. There's the short answer and the long answer. The long answer I'm going to explain to you later after the presentation. The short answer is that that's reagent magic. So reagent. Remember, reagent takes this. This is closure data. It transforms it into React component. In the process of doing that, it's adding a lifecycle hook, which is checking the atom to see whether it's in, during deref to trigger a re-render. Is that follow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. It's a few years since I did this. Mm -hmm. and, um, was, is that Hashpark? Uh, Hashpark Hash 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 Hash
Would that be equivalent of like a back tick in, in classic ways? Yeah. Or is it so close like like that's a that's a great that's a great question because you're like, you're barking up the right tree basically. But closure has more like more think of it as closure has multiple forms of back tick, and some of them are considered special, and this is one of them. Is that yeah? Yeah. It doesn't follow. It, it goes away from my classic list. There's more syntax than you would find in a classic list. Yeah, that's another like and good answer great, to the question. But there is more syntax than yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just to recap quickly, to reagent is a small like and this is all reagent does, by the way. You're like, wait, what about my like action reducers or whatever? Reagent doesn't have any of that. All reagent has are radums components. That's it. All right. And then you just bang on these atoms using core library functions. The swap is also a core library function. You just bang on atoms using core library functions. So that's what reagent is. Reagent is a very small library. I think total number of code, it might be like 200 lines or something. Some very, very small library. Don't quote me on that, but it's not big. It's not heavy, I should say. It's not heavyweight. So it's not a wrapper for React, it's just a implementation of React? No. Yeah, it is, it is exactly a wrapper around React. Yes, yeah. Under the hood, it's using React. Okay, so that's what reagent is. The trick is that it's, it's doing that efficient checking between, if you've, got, if you've got a big old component tree and you've got an atom in the root of the component and you deref that atom, Reagent is doing that very quick check and saying, oh, is, is, did this component actually change or not? Right? It's, again, it's doing that under the hood in its implementation. So the bottom line is it's very fast. You can get rendering quickly. Yeah. So what if you want to make lots of changes before you end? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. Do you, you have another question? I was just going to say that my understanding was the R and R atom is for reactive, not reagent. Because it's actually pushing back into that function. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. It Correct. makes a difference because that's letting that reagent drive, not standing. Or yeah, yes, that is correct. That is a very technical correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let me answer your question with basically what happens, like with this section right here. So the reagent is not opinionated about. How many atoms should you have? Should there be one big one or like 20 little ones? Where should they go? You know, at like what if I need to update five of them at a time? Is Reagent gonna efficiently handle that? Yeah, right? That's kind of what you're asking. Well, I mean, you changed it and it rendered. Yes. That's all I know. Good, so right. My right. question is what if I want to change 10 things? Mm -hmm. And then I want to render. Otherwise, I have it renders 10 times. Yeah, right. So I like, got like Reframe! <laughs> it's kind of the answer to your question. Right? So, so basically it's like people like reagent or reagent is a great little library that doesn't do enough. It doesn't, right? Like it's got this, it's, it doesn't take you all the way. So again, how many atoms should I have? Where should they be? What happens when I want to queue up 20 of them for a single batch render? Questions like that, right? Questions you might have on, for example, a team of software developers where we all need to be on the same page about how many atoms there are, or when do we deref them, and don't deref a thousand atoms in a single frame render, right? Questions like that. So, now we get to the point of the talk. What is reframe? Reframe is a state management system on top of reagent. So we've got JavaScript, ClojureScript, React, reagent, and finally, up there in the clouds is reframe, which is why we're all here tonight. Yay. Yeah? Okay. So it, you can think of it like Redux for, if Redux, you know, Redux is state management for React. Reframe is state management for Reagent, which is kind of, Reagent is using React under the hood, right? So here's the cool thing about Reagent. That thing you want it to do, it does it automatically. You can, you can bang on the atoms all you want asynchronously, and they will render every request animation frame smoothly and you can't even, like you don't have to mess with that at all it just works great right so everything is asynchronous meaning meaning you can do lots of asynchronous updates and they'll get batched and only it will only render the last one to the page so you can't like thrash the browser if you try to like if you send a thousand events in d during like immediately the browser is not going to try to render a thousand it'll render one the last result 
It has yeah. no yeah. hypothetical with the last. Mm -hmm. At this point, we become a video game, right? We're flipping yeah. at 60 frames a second and yep. changing. Yep. So, so it's because it solved the halting problem. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it, so I mean, it, it knows, it knows, the answer is that it knows, um, it, you know, it's got, the, the, the browser's got request animation frame timers that let you hook into the render. That's kind of the answer to your question. But yes, absolutely, it's a video game, and it's a single loop, and it's a single render loop. Right. Okay. So, but it so, the, mm -hmm. so I see the DR for it, and why do you want to use it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So remember earlier when I was talking about Redux, and we had the store, which is the one source of truth, and you're like, what state should my application be in? And the answer is, well, what time is it? Did the user click that button or not? <laughs> right? Are they logged in or not? Did we show that, did that Ajax request error or not? Right? You don't know the error. Right? It depends on what time it is. So in Reframe, you've got your whole application is stored as what we call the app DB, at like application database. And it really is like a database. Think of it like, like my friend Brian likes to reference it and call it like a spreadsheet. He says, think, like who's ever had like a big spreadsheet with lots of data? And then you've got like lots of uh, other sheets that reference like the big sheet. Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And so you've got all this like derived views, essentially, from the kind of the one master sheet. That's how Reframe works. That's the mental model you want for Reframe. So your app DB is the mothership. This is where all the state is stored. And then all of your little React components can listen to the DB and say, I care about, like, I've got, this is the app DB, this big thing that's in here. I'm a little React component over here. I care about this chunk of the app DB. That's what I need in order to make the HTML correct. And I don't care about the rest of it. I just need this little piece. Reframe wants you to set that up. It's really, really nice. And it, again, because it's using Reagent under the hood, this will only change when that little piece of the big app DB changes. Does that make sense? So think about an application as you're clicking around. You're generally not, I mean, it depends on the application, but you're generally not, if you've got a bunch of state in your application, you're generally not wholesale changing all the state with every click or every typing, right? It's really rare, right? Often you're just like pressing a single key or clicking a button or, I mean, sometimes you've got a big transition, right? Sometimes it's like we're going from big page A to big page B, and we kind of throw away all the state on page A and create the state in page B, but most of the time it's little micro interactions, right? Right? Okay. Uh, who like who loves UI development? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we got some people. I got some people. <laughs> I love this stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now we know what reframe is. So we know it's it's for closure script. Yes. How would you? Is there a way to access the same capability? Not the closest thing to the closest thing to reframe is Redux. So you just use Redux, and then but it's not it's not okay. it's not as good. <laughs> <laughs> like right, like yeah, like like closer people are like eh, you know, but but yeah, like Redux is the closest thing in the JavaScript world, I think. To um, so reframe doesn't work on Elm or anything else. It's not it's really correct. Closure. Correct. It's written in closure script. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the downs, like. One of the downsides of it is, you know, you're you're all in. You know what I mean? You're pretty much all in on reframe, right? And closure script. But that's also an upside, <laughs> you know what I mean? So okay, I'm gonna breeze through this and get to code because I've I'm taking too much too much on this. All right, we talked about community and size of community, and I do think this is worth mentioning. A reframe community. Lots of excellent documentation, lots of excellent examples. And if you, this guy's nodding his head because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. And if you pop into the reframe Slack channel like right now and you ask some question, you're probably going to get an answer in like 20 seconds from the guy that made the library. So that community question about reframe, it is no problems, right? And that guy, yeah, he knows. He knows. So uh, excellent performance. I already kind of mentioned this. That's really like <coughs> a function of closure scripts influence, but reframe inherits it. Uh, Okay, but da, 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 da. how's it work? Benefits of it. Who wants to see some reframe? Yeah, let's do this. I spent like most of my time preparing this presentation writing these examples. So, okay, how about we do a counter? 
Oh, by the way, all of the code in here is online, GitHub, and it's open source. So go for it. All right, here is the, let's look at the counter. So I'm gonna click the button and it increases, all right? We've seen this before. All right, so I've got an initial state, number of times clicked, all right? You've got, again, I was gonna spend a lot of time going through this vocabulary, but I think just we'll go right to code, okay? We've got, um, you've got events that update the state, right? So events come in, you send, you dispatch events. Events are always just data. Then you've got, so you, imagine you've got a house, a house, a house, a house. You have like six houses in a row and they got big fences between them. And so you know you have a neighbor, but you can't like, you don't know who they are or whatever. And you've got like a bucket of tennis balls and you take a tennis ball and you take a Sharpie and you write on it. You say, user clicks button five. And you throw that tennis ball over the big tall fence. Yeah? And then the, the guy on this side, they're waiting. They're waiting and they're like, oh, we got it. It's a user clicks ball, ball, or what did I say? User clicks button ball. And so they go to the tube for the user clicks button, right? But what if you sent them a ball and it's the quizzle ball and there's no quizzle tube? What do you do? You just throw it away and log an error message, right? Or do you break the app? <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Found the anarchist. Found the anarchist. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, like, 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 basically, if you send an event that you don't, so you you dispatch events, you handle events. Those events then return data that explains how to update the store, the app. I'm gonna say app DB, not store. Then. App, uh, AppDB is updated, and you've got all your subscription functions that are listening to their piece of the store, and they go off and they re-render, and then that loop completes, right? So when you read the reframe docs, it's going to talk about like this. It mentioned it like it mentions the same thing three times in a row, but they keep talking about this flow. There's like six steps in the flow. You dispatch event, your event handler handles it. You update the AppDB. Your descriptions see that they render the whole thing starts over again. It's this continual loop, right? Here's the cool part, it's a Lisp. It's a running system. We can add events and subscriptions, or sorry, we can add events and event handlers and subscriptions and components dynamically anytime we want in the system. We can trigger them. Yeah, we, yeah, you can trigger them. So, okay, let's, let's see. Uh, this is an event handler. This is just handling initialize. And it's setting the, this initial state of number of times clicked. That's what that does. This is incrementing, and it just updates the DB with that inc function. Does that kind of make sense? I'm kind of I'm kind of glossing over this. That will be reducers hmm? and Redux. These are reducers and Redux. Yes, this is like a reducer. What's up? Is anyone lost in the, in, in syntax? Shit. Yeah. Yeah. Because there is a really for anybody that's not familiar. This can be really confusing. Just yeah. Because of the notation. There's like, there's no way that that's going to, people are going to like learn that in the course of a talk. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here's a subscription. You're not alone if you're confused. Yeah. So here's a subscription that's like, it just returns the number of times that it was clicked. And then if you squint your eyes, what does this look like? <laughs> <laughs> right. So basically, on this button, we have an on click event. And what are we doing? We're just dispatching this increment data. So this, what I've got highlighted, that's just data. That's a vector of a key. That's a vector with one keyword, and it just says increment. And I'm just saying, when you click that button, dispatch the event, the increment event. Yeah? Okay. So if I change that to like the increment ZZZ event, and I come over to the code, and I click it, oh, reframe. I don't know what to do about an increment ZZZ because you didn't tell me there's no handler for that. That's again, that's the quizzle ball that gets thrown away. So like, it's really nice. Reframe is just saying, I don't know what to do, right? But I do know how to deal with inc an increment event, right? Is everyone tracking with that? Okay. You will, should we add a decrement? 
Yeah. Okay. So um, let's just copy this. Oh, whoops. Do that. Copy, paste, minus one, and we're gonna send decrement. Everyone good with that? So there it is. Shows up in the page. A uh, quick thing. You're probably like wondering if I'm refreshing or what's happening here. Uh, let me set this up. Stupid Windows. That was the So if you come over here and you make a change, so I'm going to just press save on my editor, and then see that little thing that happened there. So that's the tooling. It sees that I've changed the namespace and it's just hot reloading it, right? And then. I've got a little hook that says, oh, every time we, we hot reload something, just trigger re-render from the root, and so then I get the, the, the change. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. It's not like, this is table stakes for closure script tooling. If you can't do this, you're not, you know, you're not even welcome at the table, basically, right? So, okay, so we've got decrement, and, but have we written the, the, the decrement, uh, have we written that handler yet? No, so we're getting a nice little reframe error warning us what's going on. So we come over here and we call it decrement. This is so hard to see, I'm sorry. And any guesses what we do? Deck. Again, I'm just pressing save and we're off to the races. Keep going. What happens next? Okay, not bad, right? But we're just sending, so if, if you're familiar with Redux, that we're just sending, we're doing very simple, uh, what is it called? Actions, right? Actions, right? But we didn't have to write any action creator functions. We literally just dispatch increment and decrement. Well, what if some smarty pants is like, listen, adding one and subtracting one is actually just math on top of the plus. You're just plussing negative one, or, right? Smarty pants, no? Okay. <laughs> What if we want to like plus five? Do we write like increment five? Like we could do this, or we could just make it generic and be like increment and then pass in data. Oh, what? So, and then let's get, let's get, let's get super crazy. Let's do like 10 and then um, let's increment by like Mark. Mark. Actually, let me, let's, let's wait on that for a second. Okay, so now our increment needs to, the event that's, so I didn't, this is where I should have explained reframe. Uh, when you write a reframe app, 99, probably 98% of the functions you write are either pure data or pure functions. And what happens is anything that's not pure data or a pure function, it gets like pushed to the edge of the system and then that's where you like make an AJAX request or get something from local storage or touch that weird JavaScript library that mutates the state or whatever, right? So like I'm not exaggerating when I say that 98% of the code you write in Reframe is pure functions or data. You're just in that world all the time. Right? Well, but why, why would that be the case since you argue that it's so easy to move into non-pure into mutable state? Well, what I mean by that, so okay, so for example, your these these are your uh, event handlers, and they they need to be pure, right? Like in order for reframe to work correctly, these need to be pure functions. But you can absolutely like do this. I yeah. guess that's the question. I'm okay. Asking. Is yeah. that discipline, or is the language actually encouraging you? To, to what, to be pure? Yeah. That it's, it's so much easier to write pure functions than to yeah. write like enclosure. Like I mean, I mean, everything in the core library pretty much is a, is a pure function unless it has a bang at the end of it and then it's like by definition <laughs> not pure. Um, I guess my, like my, that comment earlier was kind of like, you can't do this in Haskell or, you know, or whatever. Like you have to like wrap this in a monad or something. And like, or like you can't do this in Rust. Rust will be like, nope, well, I won't even compile. You, you know, borrow checker, you're wrong. You know, like, like it's very rare. Like when, when the closure compiler tells you that you're wrong, it's often helpful. Like, um, let's say instead of DB, I call, I say like DBZ and I press save. 
Oh man, like how helpful is that? Use of undeclared var dbz, and it's literally pointing to it right there in the browser, <laughs> right? That's like, that's like rather convenient. Okay, what were we doing? Were we incrementing? We were passing in data to increment. Is that right? Okay, so uh, da -da 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 -da. this is the number that we passed. So you can pass in your data. It's just like it's just like a Redux action. You can pass in data, right? It doesn't have to be um, just a single keyword. Yeah. It's hard to teach this when people don't know closure. Yeah. What am I doing? So I've got increments one, five, and ten. How does this math work? Uh, am I doing this right? Like plus yeah. the value, the number? Yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. There's got to be an easier way to do that. Whatever. Oh, yeah, it's working, right? Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I changed it to, yeah, I changed it to be one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what if we try to increment mark? Right. That's totally going to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, I mean, how would we want to deal with this? It's kind of the question. We could do like a precondition and we could say, uh, this is just like a closure thing where you're saying this function has to, this has to be true. Or it just, I think it, what is it, you get a runtime error? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> How about if, if, if we do that, else we just return the database? Uh, does that, no, not helping. And then we can log something, we could say. <laughs> that might work. Let's see, just, uh, it just does nothing. And then we could log something and we could say like do, uh, There we go. It's helpful. Yeah, okay, I, I know you guys can't see this. How can I make that bigger? So if you don't uh, test for it, it throws an error. Uh, what it would do, I mean, what it would do in that case is it would, um, what would it do? You'd probably just get a runtime error. You get a runtime error, yeah. You're just trying to add a string to a number. Yeah, well, I want to see it. You want to see the runtime error? Paul likes Paul Paul likes to watch things explode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm just, just I'm just don't, just don't test for that, that right. it. That go back to the version they had five minutes ago. Just... Okay, that, that's what I just did, but I I, I follow you. You're saying like that, yeah. right? Okay. Um, yeah, see, it, it works because the JavaScript is not strongly tied. Yeah. Yeah. It would work. You yeah. can yeah. it work. I was like, uh, JavaScript is well, going to convert that to a string and add it. No problem. I strongly to, to, support that. You strongly support that? <laughs> <laughs> to me, yeah, I mean, so I'll, honestly. Let me, ask, let, me, so, let, me, let, me be, let me be just a terrible person. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated somehow. Interesting because. It's just interesting how different people are. Like, you couldn't add a number. Like, before, like, how do I add a number? You know, like, like in the code you were writing, like, oh, that, I know you, you do the plus thing. And that's fine. Just that that's usually the opposite of the way you think of, like, people who, like, write C code. Like, they know exactly how to add a number to that. But since you're writing HTML, is your, mod, is, your, is your algebra, right? Your mother is in HTML data. You don't necessarily need to add non-numbers to an algorithm. Do it naturally in those things. And then you weren't a JavaScript programmer more, you were more like a closure programmer. So you didn't know that when you had a string to a number, it was just going to 
Thing there. Well, and no, I, was, I was just I was trying to follow that. I was like, oh, but this is just going to do that. So it's just yeah. interesting how when people problem. get into their, yeah. their world and they think differently, and they and and it's just that's just fascinating to me to see how people can think how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah to, to, to be. Like, like I mean, I'm I'm, I'm very like, I'm very very familiar with JavaScript, yeah, yeah. right? And what, what I actually wasn't sure of was whether the plus in because that's not necessarily the plus operator in JavaScript. That's like a closure core function, and it might it yeah. And so it, 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 it I was I was I was thinking that that I was thinking that that function would throw a runtime error. I know, but you seem like you were struggling to find out how to add two numbers. Yeah, that wasn't an increment. That's kind of like the calendar. No, 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 no. I mean, fire a closure and you type one plus mark, it's going to give you a runtime error. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. Is, yeah, yeah. This is a closure script thing. If you closure, if you copied that, and I, we didn't cover the difference. So it would blow up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it, it would blow up on the JVM. Yeah. But it would blow up on the JVM. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I think like. It, like like there could be a yeah like there, there could be a function called plus that would throw runtime error instead of like what they must be doing is just passing that directly to the plus yeah, operator in JavaScript yeah. right yeah right. which like th that's what surprised me that's the right. thing about JavaScript yeah yeah implementing yeah. a plus sign and the plus operator in JavaScript are two different things that plus signing in this land is a function. And then JavaScript. Is it's an operator. Operator. Yeah. So you're saying that the disconnect is between real closure and closure script. But I mean, if you if instead of mark, you put in like one like string one two three, then it would add. You know. It would. It wouldn't add one two three. Actually, if I one, two, three, if I put in if, if if I put in like a a, a hash map, I, I wonder if I actually do get a runtime error. <laughs> Because I mean, it, it might, it might try to do like, so no, so it's trying to do like string conversion. So it's call, it's calling dot two string on it or whatever. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay, we're in the weeds. And this is, this I totally agree with you on so many things, but this is why people like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It would, yeah. It would prevent that. Do we? So I built this other uh, example. Do Do we want to see more on the counter example? Or I built this other example where you can search a list of students. Wow, now that looks like me. And you can refresh, or you can, that, that this list is being fetched from JSON, so it has a side effect. So it's more like, let me just go through this, and then we can talk about stuff. Because uh, it's like also 8.30, I don't want to take all night. This first simple example, I, I put it all in a single file, and that was just, like, that's not what you would do in a real app, I just did it for convenience. Also, and like, again, this is on GitHub, you can check it out. But I'd like to, I'd like to, instead send you to the official reframe examples, which are excellent, and they have two of them. One of them is very simple; it's in a single file, and like every line is commented explaining what's going on. It's very difficult to read that example and not understand like what's going on in reframe. So definitely recommend that. But my examples are also available. And then I made a more uh, more complex example that might show you what would look like kind of when you don't just have everything in one namespace, you might actually have like tabs and pages and kind of some real complexity. So um, again, I kind of like, people don't know closure, so the syntax is alien, and I was gonna maybe demo some stuff, but I think maybe you can just kind of play with this on your own as a better approach. Um, let me just talk about the benefits uh, when you get to scale. Uh, where is it? So again, most of what you're writing is like pure functions and data. Um, the benefits of it are stable, consistent syntax everywhere. Again, that's like a closure benefit, but you're getting that. There's no confusion about how things work. How do we, uh, how do we like we want to update the app DB. How does that process start? We dispatch an event. Then we have an event handler. Then we change the app DB. Then we have subscriptions. Then we render, right? So like if you're on a team of people and you need a cohesive, like how are we all going to do this together, reframes a really good option for that, right? Um, I, I worked at Cisco for three years and used a different library, basically doing the same thing, but we, but it was like less opinionated and we ran into issues of like multiple people wanted to do things different ways and we just had trouble kind of getting on the same page. Yeah. Was that a derivative of Rum? No, it was a uh, Rum. It was Rum without Citrus, <laughs> which was the problem. Yeah. Good, good question. Uh, so again, most of code you write is either data or pure functions. That's easy to test. It's easy to reason about. Right, you get those awesome dev tools. 
Uh, do, do, do. Side effects could push to the edge of the application. I think I want, maybe want to show that real fast in the complex app. Uh, events and subscriptions decouple update logic from view logic. So you've got your one source of truth and you want to update it and you know that eventually downstream you want to see that update. But very often you can, like if you make a change here, you don't necessarily have to need to make a change down there. Does that make sense? Right, these things are decoupled where in, in a lot of UI programming, those things are totally coupled. Like in the, in the, uh, in the, reagent, the reagent example, where you have that, you're taking that atom and you're passing it straight into your click function and you're swapping on it right there in the function, that's absolutely coupling of what's doing the updating and then what's doing the rendering. Because it's literally inside of it, <laughs> right? Um, but in reframe, you've got these, like again, think about these fences in these houses. I'm in event mode, I'm in event, or I'm in yeah, dispatch mode, I'm in event handler mode, I'm in um, what's called co effects mode. I kind of glossed over this stuff. All right. Um, it, works, it works at scale because you can namespace the events. So you don't just have to have some big global, like all the events of your application, you can put namespaces on them. So for example, you can have things like, uh, you know, accounts page slash init or header slash select tab homepage. If you're just looking at these and I tell you that these are reframe events, you have a pretty good guess what those are going to do. Like you haven't seen the application. I'm, I'm like, I'm, let's say I go into my reframe application, I print off all the events and I hand them to you on a sheet of paper. Here's all the events, what they're named and the data that pass in. You should be able to read that and be like, okay, I like have an idea what this app does. Does that kind of follow? So that's like, that's nice. It's a nice way to think. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay. You basically never need to worry about performance due to PDSs. PDSs, uh, the persistent data structures, those work at like heavy, heavy scale. Uh, okay, who wants to hear about downsides? You got to talk about two sides of the coin. Totally. Uh, yeah. oh. I, I do want to hear about downsides, but I, mm. I have a question that's a little more um, practical. Yeah. Uh, not that downsides are practical, but yeah. Now let's say that you're a, you know, experienced server developer and you have very little artistic talent and you don't know what looks good on the front end, if you just build a React, a reframe app like out of the box, does it look nice? Uh, it, that's, a, it's a, it's a, that's a great question. The answer is that it-, it Like do I have to be a CSS genius in order to make this look nice or? The, the answer is that reframe has nothing to do with that and has no opinion. So, so, there's, so it, it has no connection to CSS, there's no CSS in it. It's only concerned with managing your, your DOM stay. Yeah. And, and, and my, my, my other example is that pick like a, like what you want in that case is you want to pick a CSS framework uh -huh. that comes with a bunch of design for you. Uh -huh. So, um, like bootstrap or something. Bootstrap, Bulma, Material UI, uh -huh. yada, yada. Yeah. You have, you have an answer to that question. Semantic UI. Plus, Semantic UI. Um, sign for hackers isn't that close, but, uh, otherwise, I can't remember. Yeah, I'll Oh, um, but there's a bunch of great stuff out there for you know basically for white space and stuff like that. Yeah. What's that thing yeah. called again? Design, Design for hackers. No, 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 the other semantic UI. Yeah, semantic UI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's resources for that. It's it's a great question. Yeah. Um, okay, downsides. So you got to learn closure script. <laughs> <laughs> and there's like there, there's for sure a learning curve with closure. Uh, I will argue. Tell him blue in the face that it's worth every minute or any kind of complexity that you know it's totally worth it. Um, I don't meet anybody. I've never met a single human being who's like, yeah, I really regret learning closure. Like, yeah, yeah, you regret. Is it? I can't do my day job anymore. Yeah, I, stand it. <laughs> I know. I, I know. It's like you have the yeah. Like, but but, but I bet you're better at like what what language yeah. is that? Is it what, what's the C++. language? C plus plus. I bet you're better at C plus plus, right? I confuse my coworkers gloriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a great, it's like the best problem to have, you know. Um, but it is, it is a learning curve, so you can't say that's not a downside. Um, you have to learn kind of the reframe vocabulary. You've got to learn these concepts, events, and handling them, and then co effects, which I didn't explain, but you can read about in the wonderful docs. Um, subscriptions can get complex. So again, I kind of, for time purposes, I think I should wrap it up. But when you're pulling that information out of the app DB. You can have lots of those and they're called subscriptions. And they're both like powerful, but you can like, that's where complexity can be. 
So remember the spreadsheet analogy where you've got your big master page and you've got all these like derivative formulas that are on multiple pages? Sometimes you have like a formula that references another formula that references another formula, and now you're nine formulas deep and you're like, oh my God, I don't know what's happening. You can do that with subscriptions, it's, it, right? Like they, they allow for that. And you wouldn't want to go nine levels deep, that's silly, but you totally would want to go like two or three levels deep. Sometimes you get a lot of power from doing that. And I just put it on, like, this could also be an upside, right? I just put it on downside in the sense that that's, like, that's where the complexity is in a reframe app. Um, it's like never in the view layer, which is really nice. So your views, like you never do any data manipulation in view at all. All your view is, is like, what data do I need and exactly what format do I need it in? Get me out of the app DB and all I do is render. So what you see a lot in JavaScript, Redux, React applications, are very long, very complex components. Who has worked with a large, complex React component? Well, there's lots of state, and, and yeah, exactly. That you never have that problem in reframe. All the components are dead simple. There's no data manipulation. If you're doing data manipulation in a reframe component, you're doing it wrong, you need to put it in a subscription. Um, so that's like downside, but also like subscriptions are really powerful. Uh, blah, 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 blah. You've got to decide what structure you want that DB. So let's say that I've got <clears throat> like some JSON students.json. Let's say I've got my students and I'm storing them in an array of objects like this. So I've got like, you know, a thousand students. Well, like an array has order, right? Well, is that necessarily the order we're going to render it on the page? Well, maybe not because this is in the table and we want to click on the header and we want to sort and that kind of thing. So if you store it as an array in your app DB, maybe you realize later, oh, that I want that to be like a hash map where the, the key is the student ID and the value is the student. And then in a subscription, I'll pull the values out, convert it to a, to a vector and then sort it how I want. Right, you're nodding your head because you you've done this before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. the dots, but I haven't gone all the way through it. Okay, okay. Can you normalize that data in the app DB? Can you, say again? Is there a way to normalize it? That, what I'm saying is that that's what you want to do. And that, and that that's like, that, that's, a, that's a gotcha. If you don't normalize that data in your app DB, you're probably gonna run into problems later with either a subscription or an update function. And what often happens is you pick some structure for the app DB, and then two or three features later, you're like, oh man, it's just, that was the wrong choice. <laughs> and so now I've gotta go back and change it. And the problem, again, it's, this is downsides, but because you've got events that handle, that operate on the app DB, and subscriptions that pull from it, so if you make a change in the AppDB, you are gonna to have to kind of write some code on both sides of the fence, right? You've gotta coordinate both, both ways. Where normally those things are decoupled, now they're, de now they're coupled, you know, yeah. How do I query the AppDB? With the subscription. Do you wanna see those, or? Okay, okay. Uh, let me just cover through the structure. Yeah, so it's hard to go back to JavaScript once you learn CLJ. <laughs> That's my downside. You can put emojis in markdown files, people. Okay, uh, let me show you a subscription, and then let's end the presentation or take questions or, yeah? Okay. Uh, so, the, like, like, this is students, okay? And so when we, when we refresh the page, we're gonna do a little Ajax request, and that's a side effect. I'm gonna skip that for now, but it's in the code. Um, and then we can search for the students. So if you search, right, everyone track in with this? Pretty simple. So let's look in the students. Where's the subscriptions? Okay, so here I'm getting the students out of the AppDB and I'm just storing them directly in the AppDB as a hash map where it's student ID, student, student ID, student. And then I've got the search text which is just that string that's in the, that you're typing when you're searching. And then check this guy out. So I'm calling this subscription filtered students. And I'm, what this is is kind of like a little quirky macro syntax where I'm saying, fetch me students and search texts, and then pass those into here. So this is very much like a spreadsheet where you have a formula that references two other cells that references the master sheet. You guys know what I'm talking about? This subscription is listening to the two subscriptions above it. And those are connected to like the real thing, right? 
Does my component know that? No. And if I want, if I go in here and I change this to be some like more derivative or straighter to the DB or whatever, if I muck this around, but I don't change the name of filtered students, do I have to change anything in the HTML? No, because it's decoupled. So just to show you that, I put it all in the same namespace. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Boom, right? So all I'm doing here is I'm getting the filtered students. I'm just subscribing to filtered students. Where did they come from? How many are there? Are they sorted? I hope you've solved that problem because all I'm going to do is just, if it's empty, show this little thing and then we're just map indexed over the row and render the rows. Is that following? Or yeah? Yeah? Cool. Yeah. So um, this is really cool. Um, on the census page, I'm doing some cool shit with this. Like that, you know, that multi level filtering and stuff? I'm talking to Marcus right now. Um, oh, that's like a badass subscription that it's like nested and you can pull it at, I'm like chaining functions and stuff. It's really cool. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me, so it's going to be recorded. This is on GitHub. You can check it out. We're time constrained. This is a great logo for a programming language. And these are stickers and they're yours. You can have them. I have hundreds of them. Take them. Um, this is my card. I'm easy to find. Thank you for coming to the talk. Great. What questions do we have? Thank you for staying late, and I'm ha yeah happy to answer questions. I just want to. Do you want to leave? That's good. Oh, it does. Yeah, it's a good okay. Okay. Blows up and closes. Oh yeah, of course. Of course it would because it's JVM. Yeah. 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 yeah, it's a runtime. It's a runtime difference. Yeah, you know, I'm actually gonna. Okay, I'm actually gonna point that out as an example of of closure as a language is practical. It's practical on the JVM for it to blow up, and it's practical in JavaScript for it to do the stupid thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So like, they're fundamentally compatible on some level. Yeah, yeah. So like, you've got the same language, but it's making a practical choice here and a practical choice there. You know, like in defensive closure. Uh, <laughs> so, it could be correct. Yeah. It's a job, yeah, it's a Java bytecode. And is the interop still describing on Java? Oh, yeah. Stronger. Yeah. Stronger. yeah. Really? It was developed to, like, closure yeah. was developed to solve concurrency. So that was a major sign. Yeah. 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 Grab a closer script sticker. Yeah. Do you know another one? I guess. What I got is beautiful. Well, what I, that's not true. What I'd like to see in this trade version is really design a real application, a web application. Yeah, you use a cat program. Right. You know, do all the numbers, you want the numbers itself. And do all the things around by five pieces. You have you drag and drop items, replace things, and you get what you see, what you get. Am I wrong? We get you guys. Are you talking like an out of the box? You saying you want like a visual visual yeah, editor for a web application? Yeah. So you have yeah. when you write a real serious complex web application, you normally would use maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Oh, some kind of visual. That's right. But you place the button, you see the exchange in real time, and have different languages. Hi. 